Welcome back to Vidorama, where we remember the VHS releases of the past in graphic detail. My name is Aaron Jones, and I once again invite you to join me as I paint a tribute to another movie from the past. This month's painting is devoted to that classic George Romero, Stephen King collaboration, Creep Show from 1982. As ever, I prepared the drawing beforehand and I've photocopied it onto card for painting. Oh, uh, stick around for the rest of the video and find out how you could win your very own copy of Creep Scene. The colours I'm using today are Cadmium Orange, Mars Black and Titanium White. As always, I reapplied the detail using a pen. Now I usually start off these videos by giving a brief synopsis of the film that I'm painting but this is an anthology movie uh, made up of five stories, uh, six if you include the prologue and the epilogue. Uh, I will address each one as I go along. I think I've mentioned before that I love anthology horror movies and Creepshow is definitely one of my favourites. I would say that it's actually one of my all time favourite horror movies as well. I love everything about it, style-wise it's a work of art, the way the comic panels are created on screen, adapted for the cinema. It's entertaining, it's like an old spook show. Its use of music and sound is just amazing, um, its use of backgrounds, the lighting and the colours, it's just a treat. The cast is made up of an amazing collection of character actors, some of which with a close connection with horror. And of course not forgetting the creatures that feature. Regarded a cult classic created by great horror icons. At the helm, George A. Romero, legendary pioneer of horror film genre and of course the father of the zombie film. He was born in New York in 1940 and he was raised in the Bronx with a love for cinema. He graduated from college and started making short films and commercials. Interestingly, he started out his career working on the set of Mr. Rogers' Neighbourhood. But by the mid-60s he had become bored of making commercials and he decided to make a horror movie and that movie was Night of the Living Dead, released in 1968. Considered a game changer by many, he would then go on to make other movies such as Season of the Witch, which was originally released as Hungry Wives, uh, The Crazies, Martin, and of course the sequel to Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, released in 1978. Now established as a horror director, it was around this time that he was approached by Warner Brothers who had just acquired the rights to Stephen King's Salem's Lot. Uh, they wanted Romero to direct. This was when he met Stephen King. Being mutual fans of each other's work, they hit it off right away and became lifelong friends. Salem's Lot was eventually turned over to Warner Brothers Television and was adapted as a television miniseries and so Romero left the project. But both he and King vowed to work together on another project someday. They discussed possibly adapting King's newly released novel The Stand, but Romero felt it was a too big a project. And so he pitched another idea for an anthology movie that he had, a series of short horror stories presented in different cinematic formats, black and white, Technicolor, 3D, which celebrated how the horror movie had evolved over the years. But King told him that it should instead celebrate something else that had inspired both of them, EC Comics. I'm going to assume that you already know about EC Comics, but there's always someone. Uh, they published several horror comic titles such as Tales from the Crypt, Vault of Horror and Haunt of Fear during the 50s. Uh, these comics were beautifully illustrated, cleverly written and wonderfully entertaining stories. They were great fun. With a moral code that certainly appeals to my sense of justice. And that was until one Dr. Frederick Wortham, who blamed comic books for juvenile delinquency in America, published a book entitled Seduction of the Innocent in 1954. The book placed a lot of the blame on horror comics and this prompted all manner of hysteria that resulted in horror comics being banned, in some instances burnt, and led to the introduction of the comic code and put several comic publishers out of business. But at least it put an end to juvenile delinquency or at least until Rock and Roll came along. But Romero, who fondly remembered reading those comic books under his bed sheets at night, always maintained that part of his aesthetic in the horror genre was born from those comics and not from movies. Then another icon in horror also joined the team, prosthetic makeup artist, actor and stunt performer extraordinaire, Tom Savini, Romero's friend and go-to guy when it came to special effects. Savini was firmly established as the Sultan of Splatter, he had provided effects for such movies as Friday the 13th, Maniac, The Prowler and The Burning and had worked with Romero on Martin, Dawn of the Dead and Knight Riders before. 
Savini was keen to be involved in Creep Show as it allowed him to create actual creatures for a movie. Case in point, this guy, Fluffy, the creature that featured in the crate story. My favourite. In this story, we find the university caretaker that comes across a forgotten wooden storage crate, apparently from 1834. He investigates the crate along with a biology professor, only to find that a creature actually lives inside the crate. The terrified Professor Dexter Stanley turns to his friend Henry Northup, which was played by Hal Holbrook, and Henry sees this as an opportunity to be rid of his drunk, obnoxious wife Wilma, played by Adrian Barbeau. The story didn't actually describe the creature in any real detail, so after several design sketches it was agreed that the creature should resemble the Tasmanian Devil. Fluffy is actually the first fully animatronic creature that Tom Savini had ever created, having consulted with Rob Bottin, uh, who had worked on The Thing, Piranha, Humanoids from the Deep, The Howling and Robocop. The Crate story was adapted from the short story by the same name, written by King and published in Gallery in 1979. With the crate apparently from the Arctic along with the name Julia Carpenter, this is clearly a reference to The Thing. The John Carpenter connection doesn't end there. Adrian Barbo was married to John Carpenter at the time. She had also starred with Hal Holbrook in John Carpenter's Fog in 1980. Horlicks University would get another mention in Creepshow 2, featuring on Jeremy Green's t-shirt in the Raft story. The crate itself has since become an easter egg in other movies and TV shows, hidden in the background of Jason Goes to Hell and The Walking Dead. They're creeping up on you. A story written for the film. It was about Upson Pratt, played by E.G. Marshall. A cruel, ruthless business mogul with a fear of germs. He hates bugs and lives in a hermetically sealed penthouse apartment, which soon becomes invaded by cockroaches. Not my favourite, to be honest, but uh, it's still memorable for the reported 250,000 cockroaches that featured in it. So many were required, in fact, that they hired entomologists that went out to Trinidad and caught cockroaches in the wild. Uh, they were living in caves feeding on bat guano. They brought them back to the set and bred them for the movie in their own trailer nicknamed the Roach Motel. They supplemented the cockroaches by using peanut shells painted black. I enjoyed painting his wild hair. He had many roles to his name in both movies and television, but to me, I think of either this movie, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, or Superman 2, in which he played the President of the United States. Apparently, they almost didn't film this story as the budgets were starting to run out, but um, as it was a simple enough premise, they decided to just go for it. Well, the uh, jazz ragtime track that is played by the jukebox is called Charleston and it was composed by Eric Markman. Uh, the song also featured in Evil Dead 2 in the famous blood flood scene. Something to tide you over. Another one written specifically for the film, it concerns a TV producer called Richard Vickers, played by Leslie Nielsen. Having discovered his wife is having an affair, he lures her lover Harry, played by Ted Danson, to his beach house and holds him at gunpoint, forcing him into a hole, where he is buried up to his neck in the sand. As the tide comes in, Richard leaves him to drown, revealing that Becky is also suffering a similar fate further down the beach. Richard watches Harry and Becky's demise on a closed circuit camera, and in true horror comic fashion, the lovers come back from beyond the grave for revenge. I love the way these two looked. Unique zombie design. Bloated with water, skin shriveled up, covered in seaweed and various forms of sea life. Becky was played by Galen Ross, who had already starred in another Romero movie, Dawn of the Dead, in which she played Francine. She also played Betsy in Madman before she went on to become a, an award-winning documentary maker. Ted Danson had appeared in various television roles before this, and a few months after Creepshow was released in cinemas, he achieved worldwide fame as Sam the Bartender in Cheers, before becoming one-third of Three Men and a Baby in 1987. And then there's Leslie Nielsen, one of my all-time favourite comedy performers. After countless roles in both television and cinema, starring in movies such as Forbidden Planet and The Poseidon Adventure, he would eventually change the course of his career, playing comedy in movies such as Airplane and The Naked Gun movies, not neglecting the Police Squad TV series, of course. Everyone recounted how much fun he was on set, setting off his trademark portable hand-controlled fart machine. 
once given to him by a friend at the golf club. His co-star George Kennedy would appear in Creepshow 2, of course. Last year I painted a tribute to Creepshow 2, uh, follow the link for that, and I wanted this one to accompany it. I loosely based the image on early Beano and Dandy annual covers in which the stars of the comic all feature. I thought it would be fun to have the creep holding the comic and all the characters emerge from the panels. When Creepshow was released by Warner Brothers it was a hit and it would be the only Romero film to open at number one at the weekend box office. And it still holds up, it's a testament to all that worked on it. If you haven't watched it yet, please put that right. It would be followed by Creepshow 2 in 1987, which I've already featured. So let me ask you, should I feature Creepshow 3? The film has nothing really to do with the franchise and is generally ignored by fans. Should I ignore it? Should I instead paint a tribute to Tales from the Dark Side the movie, considered by many to be the spiritual third Creepshow movie? Or just move on to the Tales from the Crypt movies? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, I'd love to know what you'd like to see next. And now we move on to the third story, The Lonesome Death of Geordie Verrill, based on King's short story Weeds, published in Cavalier magazine in 1976. It features a yokel who finds a crashed meteor on his farm. Thinking this is going to solve his financial problems by selling it to the local college, Geordie attempts to cool the meteor down with water and this causes the object to crack open and spill a glowing blue liquid into the soil. That evening, Geordie finds that the plant-like organism is now growing all over him and his farm. This is a fun one. Stephen King stars as the hapless Geordie, and uh, Romero thought it would be fun to have him play the part. He told King to have fun with the role and just play it like Wile E. Coyote. Apparently, King had an allergic reaction to the makeup he wore for the transformation. A prosthetic tongue complete with growing plants had been made, but they couldn't use it. King was meant to also have green contact lenses, but he couldn't wear them. Clearly inspired by the blob and HP Lovecraft's colour out of space. I love this one. Interestingly, when Romero met Tom Atkins, who had also starred in The Fog, who would later appear in Halloween 3 that year, of course, he was given the script and he was asked if there was a role he would like to play in the movie. He expressed a particular interest in playing Geordie but was disappointed to find that King was already going to play him. He of course played Stan, Billy's abusive father who doesn't want him reading horror comics. It's well known at this point that Billy was played by Joe King, Stephen King's son. Now a writer, uh, things seem to have come full circle when the Creepshow series adapted one of his short stories by the Silver Waters of Lake Champlain, uh, which was actually directed by Tom Savini. Stephen King appearing in movie adaptations of his work is nothing new these days, of course, but this was the first. Throughout the 80s and 90s, we were always looking out for him in the movies. Finding him in the movies was very much a game, much like spotting Alfred Hitchcock or Stan Lee. Oh, we get another King reference at the end of this segment. Uh, we see a sign pointed to Castle Rock, which is uh, King's trademark fictitious town, and Portland, Maine, which is where King was born. And the last story, which in the movie was actually the first story, we have Father's Day, which was written for the film. A family get together at a family estate for their annual dinner, which is held every Father's Day. Hank, the newest family member, played by Ed Harris, is told the story of how their great aunt Bedelia, after years of emotional abuse from her domineering father, is driven into a murderous raid when he demanded his Father's Day cake, something after seven years of being buried in the ground, he still wants. A reoccurring theme with each character for this piece has been layers, uh, fur, weeds and seaweed and now dirt. I add many differing layers of dirt to the suit using various shades of brown and each time I smudge the paint with my finger, blending it in. It makes it look as though he's dragged himself through the dirt. John Lorimer played Nathan Grantham. He appeared in many TV shows such as Twilight Zone and Star Trek. Uh, he was the old man in For the World is Hollow and I Have Touched the Sky. He also appeared in the Buggins uh, the previous year. The Nathan Grantham zombie was played by another Romero regular, John Amplis, who was also in Dawn of the Dead and Night Riders and played the title character in Martin, and he would go on to appear in Day of the Dead. 
but apparently he refused to let the crew place maggots on him so when you see maggots it's actually Debbie Pinthus that's wearing the getup. Adding more dirt either with the paint or adding lines with the pen. This one offered a chance to add lots of detail that I wasn't going to pass up. According to Savini, the owners of the mansion that they used, which was in Pittsburgh, they lost their German Shepherd and when filming had wrapped, they actually buried the dog in the hole that Nathan climbs out of. Aunt Bedelia was played by Vivica Lindforce, another with a long list of movies to her name. A few horror movies, uh, she was in Cauldron of Blood alongside Boris Karloff and she was also in The Hand starring Michael Caine. She would then of course go on to play Nurse X in Exorcist 3. According to Romero, he was delighted to have her on the project and was impressed with her work, but apparently King didn't like the way she played the character. If you like watching me add detail, buckle up and enjoy the ride. Another great zombie design, fun to draw and to paint. I think it's fair to say that the Father's Day segment sets the tone for the entire movie. The song that Ed Harris struts his stuff to is uh, library music from the 70s and the song is called Don't Let Go and it was released by DeWolf Music Limited. And yes, I did listen to it while painting. I love the entire soundtrack for that matter, sets the atmosphere, uh, provided by John Harrison who is also the first assistant director on Creepshow. He would work with Romero again on Day of the Dead before directing episodes of Tales from the Dark Side. Uh, he also composed the music for that too before directing the Tales from the Dark Side movie. He now writes and directs for the new Creepshow series. He directed one of my favourites from series one, uh, The House of the Head. The thing about applying detail is knowing when to stop. Anyway, several hours later, I thought it might be fun to have some of the weeds slowly taking over the comic page. Uh, the same way I depicted the slick in my Creepshow 2 painting. Another feature I wanted both paintings to have is a small reference to the wraparound story, so I added Billy's voodoo doll. Oh, before I forget, your chance to win your very own copy of Creepsy. This was created by Blake Toons last year, and it's an art book dedicated to the Creepshow franchise. It features the works of many talented artists and interviews with people involved in the making of the movies and the TV series. It also features my Creepshow 2 painting. If you'd like to win this book, all you have to do is click subscribe, or go down to the comment section and write Creepshow. Make sure you do it before the 28th of September 2021. That's when the competition closes. And uh, just keep looking out. I will pick a name at random and I will upload a video that announces the winner then. So, have a go and good luck. Just the voodoo doll and the pin in the throat to go. I'll add the tracking lines and I really should give Fluffy some drool before I finish it with my signature. But uh, thank you for joining me once again. I hope you found that interesting and that you like the finished painting. If so, please let me know in the comments and give the video a thumbs up. Support the channel by subscribing and checking out my other videos. And if you'd like to support it further, please check out the Patreon page and take a look at the various rewards on offer there. But until next time, good night out there, whatever you are.